Hello and welcome. This is Working Class to World Class. But before we go any further, I do have a little favour of you. If you could hit that follow or subscribe button, then that would be a massive help. Thank you. This episode is about survival, surviving war, captivity and torture. How one lady made out alive and is now an author and a world-renowned motivational speaker. Breaking through the barriers of adversity. I'm Lynn Lester and this is Working Class to World Class. So Lorata, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks for having me. <laughs> no, not at all. And before we get into everything, I, I think a uh, congratulations is in order because you have just released a book. I have, yeah. It, it was um it was really something just getting to the book, uh, just getting to publish the book. It was quite, um, oh, I don't know how to explain because it's a very emotional story. It's very personal. And so therefore I found it a little bit harder as opposed to if it was a self-help book or it was something a bit more, you know, differently creative uh, in a more imaginary world. But when something that seems so, you know, uh, unbelievable to be a true story I think it just took it took quite a bit of emotions quite a bit of crying and uh setbacks and just thinking do I really want to do this <laughs> but it's yeah. done I just I'm just gonna quickly show you I don't know if you had time to see it yeah it looks amazing yeah. I mean it's quite a striking you know front page so yeah no I've I seen it launch the other week so um yeah congratulations you must be really proud I am, yeah. This it's gotten so many uh, amazing feedback already, and even the cover. I didn't expect it because the cover was actually designed by a friend of mine, and uh, he said, Loretta, sometimes the the actual cover should speak a thousand words, and he he achieved just that because I don't come from, uh, I mean, creative world. I mean, meaning in in this sense. Uh, so, and when it's your story, you just you don't become creative you just sort of try to simplify everything when nothing is simple (laughs) yeah it's a challenge so see see for you um you know obviously you're you're now an author which is amazing um how else would you describe who you are and what you do well um I coach on public speaking and presentation skills and I've been doing that for a very very long time actually I started my career was always in coaching and development uh, mostly focusing at the beginning of my time in the UK because I couldn't really speak any English so I had to take baby steps initially when I arrived after this kidnapping but um I started my coaching and development in fitness and well-being industry. And then from then, I just wanted to constantly learn and grow. And it brought me down to attending Public Speakers University, where I just wanted to learn to better present myself and get uh, get some skills that I need in terms of communication so I'm better understood and so I can better deliver when I present but I never really thought that I would end up coaching the very thing that I didn't know anything about, which is quite fascinating. So, yeah, I've been running my uh, business on presentation and public speaking skills since about 2013. And I delivered, I lived in Asia for five years with uh, my husband and the two boys. And so I had to set up a business in Asia because I, you know, I, I didn't want to just... Um, go and not do anything so I moved I moved with a family and uh, set up from scratch which was it was great because the experts are very very supportive and I had so many people just sort of once I delivered for for a friend of my hours and they used to work for AOL and everyone was like you better be careful if you deliver you know to his team because if he thinks you are not good enough he's gonna tell everyone I was like well, what's the worst that could happen? I mean, I said, I believe in myself, my ability. <laughs> and do you know what? It's just It just shows, you know, if you are passionate about something and you're confident with it and you're humble, then you will actually reach your, your clients with great success regardless of what you do. But you have to have those three qualities of being humble, believing in yourself and really knowing your stuff. So, yeah, and then that was it. It was a word of mouth. And I just kept delivering and delivering 
it was amazing experience but uh i still practice that in the uk now that i'm back in london and um actually globally because my clients have become pretty much global because i lived in asia so I still yeah. travel quite a lot to do that. <laughs> nice, nice. And and you've kind of touched on a few things, you know, about believing in yourself. And I guess that is a premise here for working class to world class. It's all about when the odds were stacked against you, you were the underdog. On paper, you should never have been that successful. And then you're like, wow, the world just took you on or you took the world on. So you've kind of alluded a little bit about your life when you mentioned kidnapping, you mentioned your book. But before we even get to that point, and, you know, I apologise in advance. I know it's probably quite traumatic talking about these things. It's bad enough writing it, but talking about it, I, I totally get it. So if we just take you back to when you were small, when you were a little baby, can you tell us where you were born and, and where you were brought up? My parents met in former Yugoslavia, a place called Macedonia now, and they studied there. My dad is a doctor and my mom is professor of languages. Uh, they both come from different backgrounds. They're not like fully Yugoslav, but on those days, you know, it was quite unique when people mixed up. But nevertheless, I was born and then the, the town that they sort of set roots was, um, happened to be in Serbia on the border with Kosovo, and Macedonia and so therefore I, I pretty much grew up in that little kind of crease of the world you know just on the border like literally on the border and so yeah I mean it was uh it's, I, 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 I tell my kids if you were to be my age again uh, and you were in my town you would realize that you'd be lucky to have a pair of sandals and play in the you know play with your cousins and uh, find a ball that you can play with or we were just extremely um poor in in a, in a sense and although my parents worked really hard to provide I mean it was just one of those things communist country and it was ever, every ever, ever so sort of backwards and uh but the love and the respect we had the family and the surroundings I think what made it very special and to this day I still look back and I think, wow, you know, those are some memories I will cherish forever. <laughs> yeah, because you hear the word doctor. So I bet when some people were listening to your intro there, they thought her father was a doctor. They must have been rich. But to your point, where you were in the world, that did not translate from, from being a professional to having money, I guess. 100%. You know, that's such a really good point to make because I think – now that I am in the UK and we come across different doctors and we are very blessed to have so many different line of doctors with different degrees and stuff. But you look at them, some of them, you know, they work for NHS. I'm not really sure with the salaries and when they stand and because life is expensive. So I'm not pointing fingers, but then you get some of the doctors, maybe aesthetic doctors or what have you, or the, the private doctors. I'm sure they earn an absolute fortune because I, I know a few of them as well. And, um, compared to my dad and the passion he had and everything we could hardly make ends meet you know uh so it was really tough he wasn't earning much at all he had to travel on foot for like many many miles to get uh if he was lucky to get a job to to travel to these like remote places even further into the mountains and so just being able to eat and uh, you know it was just a novelty just being able to have some bread and you know some rice or meat was almost like non-existence it was something that we ate mostly around the celebrations like Eid or you know but mostly Eid really when there was the, in the in the Muslim community because I was raised as a Muslim but not strict but um, yeah so Eid was one of those times where we had meat because people donated uh, they sacrificed an animal for Eid and then they donated the meat to the poor and less fortunate people but uh, yeah, it was um, it was tough to see my dad uh, not really. I mean, he did to this day. He always says that I never became a doctor because I wanted to earn lots of money. My my passion was to help and make a difference to people. And so he was never really one to say, oh, you know, feel sorry for himself. He just he ticked all the boxes he wanted to tick. And for him, that was the most wealth he could have ever gotten out of his role. So it's really quite endearing. 
It, absolutely. And, you know, they do say that karma is a wonderful thing. You know, you do things. And, and this is why I do this podcast. Actually, I don't I don't do it to make money. I don't make a penny and nor do I want to. But it's about giving back to people and inspiring people. Just, you know, I think at the moment, a lot of people are quite lost, which I, you were, I know, certainly at, at one point in your life. And so, so see for you then, like growing up. So were you what was your like your relationship with any kind of siblings that you might have had? I am the only child. You are the only child, right? Okay, yeah, I wasn't I am, sure. Yeah, I am completely the only child. And uh, it was really quite interesting growing up because all my other cousins uh, had siblings, sometimes up to 10 siblings. Wow. <laughs> and I was the only one. And uh, it really wasn't by choice. It was the fact that my, for some reason, my mum couldn't really keep the babies and she had many, many miscarriages and so therefore, for me, she had to stay in the hospital and be hospita hospitalized until I was pretty much born. And therefore, it made it ever so special having me because, you know, it's just uh, having lost so many um, unborn babies. I think to them, it was just like a gift. And to this day, they sort of refer to me as a gift. And um, it was lonely at times, but my parents, I mean... They don't, I don't even know. When I say my parents, I mean like my best friends. We communicate so much. They became my friends because they gave me the freedom that you get from a friend, you know, that, that you can talk about anything. And I'm not saying the parents judge or anything, but I, I you can be a, bit, a little bit more hesitant of what you tell a parent. But for me, because I didn't have a sibling, I didn't know the difference. So they became my friends. So yeah, it was Aww. great. But yeah, a bit lonely at times, especially... You know, over the holiday, school holiday, I felt completely alone. But I, I, I love my own space. You know, I used to read a lot and sit in the garden, look at the sky. And deep inside, in my heart, I knew that although I was born and raised there and I was happy, happy child, for some reason, I knew I was never going to live there and settle and, you know, create roots. There's something really, it's something to be said about this because I felt it so young that that was didn't feel like home home very strange yeah I can imagine that is pretty strange I mean do you know you were talking about you know you were lucky to have sandals or or if you got a ball like so what did you do like what was a typical day like for you <laughs> oh my god just really quite simple we would go and do the skip you know the rope skip and some other games which I don't know the name I had to refer to in English because I've never had to use it and, uh, you know, we would throw stuff on the, uh, not on the mud, but just on the sand. And then we just hop and skip. And uh, But um, if that wasn't happening, then I would go and, you know, meet up with my female cousins or even the males. I love playing football and I'm quite good at it, actually. My kids love it. <laughs> so I used to play football with my cousins. I was a bit of a tomboy and loved cars and uh, we didn't have a car but my cousins did so we'd just sit there in the car pretend we're driving the car when when it's off obviously love motorbikes and if we found any motorbike in town we'd just ask the neighbors please could we sit on it and have a try and those motorbikes on those days were really simple you know much lower and so yeah just play games like that bizarrely and then we'd go into the mountains and have a little picnic there was loads of picnics over the weekends and yeah we're just gathering with different members of the family and it was one of those things as well I have to mention actually it just occurred to me people used to just show up at your door so if it was eight o'clock in the evening and you're about to go to bed all of a sudden you hear the doorbell and you're like uh, okay is it an emergency because my dad is a doctor and he's like oh hi we've just come to see you and he's like well we're about to go to bed <laughs> And so people would come late and then sit and talk and, you know, just have some food and some nibbles and it just very, very different, honestly. But uh, it was lovely. That doesn't happen anymore. Now everybody calls everyone. It's like, oh, could we pop in? Uh, no, we are busy. You know, it's become very Western. Yeah. <laughs> it's so true. Unless you're in my family and they definitely turn up whenever they phone you at half 11 at night. <laughs> um, and, and just so you know, that game you're referring to where you draw on the pavement or dirt, or whatever, yeah. we called it hopscotch. Hopscotch, okay. That's yeah, what, that's what we used to play. Yes. 
<laughs> well, in Scotland, that's certainly what we called it. I, I'm not sure if you call that in England. I think you call it in England. But yeah, for us, it was hopscotch. It was so much fun. And I think, you know, when the way you describe it, so you might not have had the money and the wealth, and but actually having your family and having food on the table and that that was wealth in so many ways, as your dad said, is it was about giving back, about being part of a community. So, you know, I can sort of, I can start, I can visualize it in my mind, how nice it must have been. You know, it might not have been the place you wanted to settle forever, but it was, you know, you, you accept what you have, don't you? You don't know what you don't know. So for you, that was your life. I wish it on the children now because they have yeah. lost complete side of reality I, and I can see with my children they are completely glued to their phones and at any point even when we go on holiday and there is like plenty to do they still want to go back to their phones just like we do the adults so I'm not judging we have moved on a lot in this yeah. life but I would wish it on anyone so if anybody wants I think we should create like a little camp for children where they go back to how their parents used to live because for me, that was just, oh, my God, the imagination and the creativity that was because you didn't have any other choice. Honestly, I if I could if I, if I could be small again and go back, I would redo it again because it was fun. It, it was something money can't buy. And I think we shouldn't lose we shouldn't lose sight of the original stuff and humble stuff. So if you can give it to your children or yourself. I think everybody should try and reach back to that kind of humbleness. Yeah. What reminds you of your childhood because it is so important to keep yeah. around. Yeah. <laughs> no, I would agree. Some of the happiest times of your life. And for you, like when did, where did you go to school and, and what were you like academically? I went to the local school. There was no private schools where everyone else went. And I, academically, I... I was actually really, really good. And and not just because it's me. I would say that I wasn't good if I wasn't, but there was this drive to learn and grow. And I was such a good uh, kid as well. I never caused any trouble. I was always on point, never late, never speaking back, always <clears throat> just because of my parents as well. I always felt, it's, it's, I shouldn't say it in a negative way, but it's almost like this obligation the only child to live up to their expectation even though they never put any pressure on me I just thought I was so inspired by their academic side of things even though you know they they weren't earning much but just because they were constantly seeking to learn and read books and you know just the way they were generally that my mom is a professor of languages so she was working with kids and so it was important for me to learn because I knew that, you know, to, to have a job that I wanted potentially or to do anything in, in the world, I needed to learn. And in, in a way, I was a little bit wrong because I, I had this thing in my head thinking up until actually 2015, 16, it was playing up on my mind a lot that I didn't have this diploma of our university in, in Serbia because of the war, I never got round to to go to university because there was no universities for years. There was war. So my generation and maybe slightly generations before me and the ones that came behind me, they were non-existent in terms of getting their qualifications, a diploma in, in something, whatever, you know. And um, my mission was to, to become a doctor like my dad because I wanted to make a difference to people. And I said to my, my dad, said, why do you want to be a doctor? I said, dad, I just want to help people like you do. And, you know, he was like sitting there and looked at me. He's like, you don't have to be a doctor. I said, don't you believe in me? Don't you think I have? I mean, my grades were incredible. I always was like at the top of the class. Uh, in fact, towards the end, I became an assistant for our professor's for our teachers uh, because I was doing technical engineering studies and my drawings and my calculation in maths and physics were just incredible and some pupils find it found it very difficult so I had the patient and I would sit with them and help them calculate and make these drawings which meant for them to pass at the exam so not being to get a qualification, you know, to go to university was uh, was really hard for me to accept. But it was 
soon after that, it was pretty much life or death kind of thing. So I didn't really have much time to dwell on it or feel sorry for myself in a way that I didn't get a qualification was yeah. a priority. But looking back, and, and since I came to the UK, that's all I wanted to do, just get some kind of qualification and study and prove myself to myself. And up until 2015, when I got offered this job to work for a hedge fund company in Singapore, in order for me to join them, because they heard me present and they said, we need you on our team. It was a Singaporean gentleman. I said, but I run my business. I'm not looking for a role. He's like, but you can still do your business, but I really need you on my team because, you know, just love the, what you said at a conference and the way you were. I said, okay. He said, well, I said, what do you need if I came part time? He said, oh, I just need your diploma from Serbia because we need to put you on a work visa and stuff. I already was on a sort of work visa, but depending on my husband's visa. And I said, well, I don't have it because it was war. And oh, he said, well, I can't. Oh, sh he said, this is a shame because I can't offer you the role now. And that really played on my mind. And I said, it took that little qualification, a piece of paper to prove that my knowledge is, is there. And then it played on my mind, but then my husband actually sat down with me, said, darling, I wouldn't worry about it because you don't have to prove yourself to anyone with qualification because you've done other qualifications, which qualifies you to what you do. So if somebody wants to work, wants you in an office and they want to base it on their qualification from your school in Serbia, that's technical engineering stuff. I mean, that's not going to even translate into the work they're giving you and sort of put me you know sometimes we all need a pep talk and a, and a mentor and even yeah. if it's a mentor in your partner or you know whoever is close to you that you trust completely and then I thought you know what he's absolutely right I think it's just niggling me because I find myself saying to the boys listen do well because you're going to go to university and you, you know and I'm thinking why am I being like this let them just you know just just have fun, study, and because some amazing people that I know they've done really well in their lifetime, and um, they actually come from hardly anything, and they manage to they just creative, and they manage to to create something out of nothing. So fair play, you don't always have to have a qualification. Not at all, not at all. I remember actually, I probably shouldn't say this on here, but I remember when my son left school and he didn't have the right qualifications for his course at college and I said to him just apply I bet they won't even check it and they didn't and he got in <laughs> so the thing is it's like you know for me for me part of it is like hustling it's like blagging it as well and also if you've kind of got the cheeky audacity then you know I think that gets you through a lot in life but a little bit of paper well you know what they didn't deserve you and you know when you mentioned <clears throat> about being in war now we can't obviously ignore this because this is you know I, I can't even imagine what that's like when, when I was a child growing up my mom and dad used to talk about World War II and they lived through the Claybank Blitz which is where where I live at the moment was completely destroyed and they had every day where they were scared because you know the alarms would go and they would have to get into the Anderson shelters can you describe what it's like for someone living like that every day well, firstly, uh, you constantly live in the same clothes that you are wearing. Very, You can never go in your pyjamas. And if you were to have a quick wash, for example, or anything, you have to be really quick. Uh, you have to rush and eat because, like you just mentioned, the siren can go off at any time. The bomb can hit a house at any time. The shooting can hit the wall of the house at any time. And it was so stressful it's, it was like a like a fright mode the whole time. It, 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 when the siren went on, it was, um, it's like end of days kind of thing. It was like the end of the world. And being young to this day, if I hear any sort of siren like that in movies, it just sends me back, back to that time. And I even remember everything, the atmosphere. It was dark and dingy and sort of, because the lights would go off and that we had zero electricity. Uh, yeah, I wasn't, uh, I, I, nobody would ever, whoever survived any anything like that would sit here and say, oh, that was all right. It is life-changing. It, it's scary. It, it leaves you scarred forever. 
So, um, yeah, it wasn't wasn't nice at all. And then, you know, having soldiers, you know, like uh, come into the house and stuff and start like turning things upside down or dragging my dad and, you know, pushing us around. You never knew. You just never knew when something like that would happen. So you never, ever felt safe. But the worst thing about our war was, and this is very important for people to understand if they haven't heard about it properly, is that unlike Ukraine at the moment, if I may bring Ukraine into this, they can leave, they can exit their borders. And, you know, we have opened the doors. We've got refugees. And I work with uh, charities to support the Ukrainian re refugees, specifically the, the vulnerable ones that are potentially to, for kidnapping and stuff. So we work really hard on keeping them safe, the young girls, the young people, children. But for us, for example, going back to former Yugoslavia, as far as Bosnia war and Croatia and Serbia war, you know, they, they, we Serbia fought, uh, even though I was born and raised in Serbia, but our country fought every single a part of their own country so Yugoslavia had many different parts so we fought each other all the borders were shut so we couldn't even escape it was like a frying pan only after NATO around I mean NATO entered Bosnia much earlier which it was slightly different for us in the south but when we sort of got NATO we never got NATO actually because we were in Serbia but NATO got into Kosovo. That's when the war started sort of easing off a little bit. And we, for us, the heat got turned up in Serbia for ethnic, uh, like Muslims, uh, so to speak. But it meant that we could now potentially, like I did, cross the borders illegally. And hopefully on the other side where NATO was, we could seek some shelter. Other than that, you had nowhere to go. We couldn't run to Bulgaria. We couldn't go into Europe. It's just nobody. I just remember nobody wanted us. You know, the borders was completely shut, and it was, it was, it was years of like being in the frying pan. And for me, that's uh, really sad because a lot of people lost their lives, and because they couldn't couldn't escape, couldn't couldn't make that choice to leave. Nobody wants to be in the war zone, especially when you're being bombed and you feel complete, completely defenseless because you don't have arms to fight against. You can't fight against an army. They've got all the most latest technology. You can't, you just can't. Civilians cannot fight against an army. It's very hard. No, you can. So, yeah, I mean, sorry to get so deep, but... No, no. I mean, I just don't think... Yeah, I mean, it just sounds horrific like literally most people you know certainly where I live I, I just think you just can't comprehend that kind of life and you know as you said you know you, you kind of seen a life beyond where you lived because you were saying you know you, you didn't think you would settle there forever but actually I bet you at some point in your life you thought you were never getting out of there because if the borders were shut you were stuck there I mean I'm sure at that moment in time you probably had a mild panic that you were trapped it felt like a trap completely. We didn't think we we're going to make it alive. It was just a matter of waiting for it to happen. It's like putting a mice in a cage and, and putting a cat in. So it's just a matter of time. To be honest, everything that happened after that, for me personally and for my family, it's almost like an absolute miracle because I, I just, I sometimes have to pinch myself, you know, and when I just, finally finished the book and because I went through so many times through it to to reread it and so on and I kept breaking down because um, yeah. although I've healed and and by all means if you've healed from something you've made peace with it and you sort of in a good place what you have to remember that 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 hurt that demon inside of you or whatever you may want to refer to that the animal of survival instinct or that panic mode that you have because of your experience it will always be there. It's just that potentially, <clears throat> excuse me, potentially um, you have put it to sleep like I have. So yeah. mine is always sleeping. And I know it sounds a bit like I'm telling children a story, but I have told my kids in this particular way because it's it's a nice way to understand so that that big kind of 
evil that happened to me still there. It's never just going to disappear. Yeah. But I have put it to sleep because I don't want that to dictate how I respond to people just because that happened to me. And in, in fact, I only have learned the opposite from it. So the one that doesn't serve me is asleep. And the one that serves me is things like I've become uh, really kind and gentle and caring and just people almost when they are approached by my kindness, by by the way I am, they question it whether my motives are are for some, you know, like what's her motive? Yeah. Like, there is no motive. I'm just, you know, I just want to show you my my respect, my kindness, that life is good. And if you haven't met a nice person so far, I just want to show you that we exist regardless of what's happened to us. So I think I have managed to and constantly continue to practice the, and it's not fake, it's genuinely a practice. It's like as if you were to go to the gym, you know, if you were to run a marathon, you don't just wake up one day and do a marathon. So it's consistently of internal in, interval training, um, endurance training as you do. Same thing with the mind, you know, I didn't wake up and just say, oh, I'm just going to be nice today. <laughs> Everything is gone. It took really, it took years. I've been in London for 23, 24 years. So it, all those baby steps of making you know, yeah. forgive others around me, forgive myself. And that was the biggest one is forgiving myself because as a survivor of such uh, atrocity or any kind of abuse, being bullying or, and this goes to anyone that's going through domestic violence, when you come away from it, you feel guilty because you question yourself. Every survivor I work with, every person that's been through bullying or domestic violence or any abuse says, I think I caused it. I think it was me. What did I do? Why did it happen to me? So they asked these questions and I was the one that asked those questions and nobody could answer me. And my psychiatrist used to sit there and just say, I understand. And the understanding of I understand, it wasn't enough. And yeah. I appreciate her time and it was great to have her because I was on a suicidal watch, but I needed to seek further, deeper answers of way of how do I how do I become this uh, person, this this child in me that was so innocent and kind and loving? How do I bring her back? And that was forgiving myself because I, I really, I really was blaming myself for everything. And um, yeah, being able to forgive yourself is one of the biggest thing you can do. And I think when you forgive yourself and you forgive someone that's done you wrong, you take away that power that controls you because. They can easily control you. So imagine if I was to hold that anger with what these guys did to me, I'm no longer hurting them. You know, what's that? They're not feeling my anger. It's I'm just hurting myself. And so I'm worth joy, not that pain still. Why should I carry them with me the whole time? I do carry them with me, but rather I've switched it, just like I switched when I was being uh, abused in this small room because we can maybe touch base on, on the story a little bit but I just remember while I was being abused initially I didn't have this I, it was really painful and it was I was screaming I was panicking uh, uh, you know all, all the things that one would do naturally because it is it is quite um d disgusting and dis it's very stressful on those situations but then uh, my mind created this pattern where when I was left to my own devices when I wasn't being abused and I was in this little small room because I was in prison for six months in a small dark room I used to use my imagination to go to places so I like you just asked me those questions of my childhood I would do exactly the same just completely forget where I was and I went into meditation I had no idea what meditation is I was 17 years of age had didn't have a clue never I never heard about meditation but just closed my eyes and lied there and I imagined you know playing with my cousins in the in the streets or um, knitting something or doing something just yeah used to do and I found that really helped me with time because time was so still in a dark room when you didn't know whether it was winter or it was summer or spring you lose track of time when you're in a dark room for six months and so 
when they came back and uh, which was daily abuse and many times a day I would use the same principle to just almost let them have my body whatever they needed to do and switch off even though it was painful and it was it's, you know it's, it's stressful to just think of things that made me feel good and at one point I had this thought in my head I said I really feel sorry for these people what must have happened to them when they were little or in their lifetime were they bullied and soon I realized that I said to myself this these are boys they were once someone else's child something like a little baby and the baby has grown into a monster and monsters are in people so I sort of literally now I tell my kids I say you shouldn't be scared of monsters in the dark the monsters are in people so it's just a matter of they yeah. walk amongst us it's just a matter of you know being aware of that so yeah just being able to detach myself in that in that sense that I yeah because I slightly diverted there but um yeah no, not at all I mean Lorette I'm I'm actually lost for words like I don't even know kind of what I can can say to you but I think for people tuning in, you know, obviously you've went into to this sort of most horrific moment in your life. Can you just explain the events that led up to when you were taken and how that happens? Um, it's um, it's a very long story, so just bear with me. I'm going to just give you the yeah. highlights. And sorry, my, my camera seems to be sideways. <laughs> for anyone that's watching, me watching this... <laughs> It's all right. It's live. Don't worry. Unedited and live. So we're good. Yeah. So um, what was I going to say? Yeah. For, about my story. Uh, well, it really started when our town was singled out for ethnic ethnic cleansing, ethnic meaning. We lived in a in a small town where my dad and my mom were working and majority were Albanian speaking Muslims. And although we were in Serbia, so it's a really kind of a um, somebody said to me your book is very educational which I didn't expect that kind of feedback because she said I learned it's like a new history that you don't get to read about you don't learn you know it's happened so recently and we know of it but we just don't know the the depth of it so it was quite a good point so it, it's it's a bit of a history new history for everyone that's listening by the border with Kosovo and Macedonia as mentioned earlier and um we got singled out for ethnic cleansing and the whole town got marched into the crease of the mountain. And to make the long story short, after, I mean, it, like reading the book, you will understand the the intensity that went on during that peri period, that evening, when we were being marched to be massacred. And uh, the, the, the point was because the NATO had entered Kosovo, their instant reaction for the Serbian army was well if you think you can control what happens because Kosovo was part of Serbia is a part of Yugoslavia so it got the Serbia got quite cross because it felt like you are taking the heart of it from them so therefore if you're gonna step into like this meaning to to the UN if you're gonna step into Kosovo trying to protect it I'm just gonna do this in my my state meaning in serbia i'm just going to do ethnic cleansing like i did in bosnia and that's what they tried to do but that evening it was a bit of a miracle in a, in a sense that i had a really wealthy uncle although and you know what because we are talking of not having qualifications and this is such a good point so when you read the book you will see that my uncle actually was a farmer he never went to school he didn't like school he was the opposite of my dad. You see, he had my dad a doctor in and he was complete, uh, you know, in 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 love with farming and, and dealing with animals, which is great. And uh, but he was very wealthy. He was one of the wealthiest guys in, in, in the area in Balkan. And so he basically uh, bribed the army that particular evening to just save us for one night at home. He begged the sort of begged. He bribed the army to 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 give all of his wealth so he can they can spare the the actual town. Uh, nobody believed it. We were all in panic. We we knew we were dying any minute, and lo and behold, that really worked uh, for the time being. So they released us, and I don't want to spoil the book too much because it's such a build up to it. But after this happened, um, my my dad 
had had noticed that there were the soldiers were abusing women and children a lot, uh, youngsters, young girls. They were sexually abusing them, and he came home uh, in panic. And he said to my mom and I, she needs to leave. She needs to cross the borders illegally and ran into Kosovo, run into Kosovo and find shelter at the Red Cross. And I was really young. And I mean, I was so scared. I'm like, Dad, I, I can't do that. I'm, I'm scared. I don't want to go into Kosovo. I don't even know the place. Although it was super nearby. I just, I don't know it. I never left my parents' sight in a way. But uh, my dad had a really strong will, you know, he said, I can't watch you being abused. And so you really got to listen and, and do what I say. And again, long story short, managed to to cross the border all by myself. Uh, it was really, uh, that was my first sort of challenge being on my own completely. And uh, it sort of, it was uh, the turning point of me never, never to live with my parents again. <laughs> yeah. So sorry. I mean, the thing is, I'm I think sorry. it's a very hard thing to talk about without getting upset. Um, you know, and I, I think, I mean, I, I think most people cannot comprehend sorry. not only, no, not not at all. And, you know, and this is the whole point of, of, of this conversation, right, is to open, not just open the wounds, but it's to talk about how you dealt with that because you're a strong woman and you look at everything that you've achieved. So but please do not apologize at all. Um. Mm. I mean, see, the thing is, like, I can't imagine, as I said, umpteen times there, you know, being in a position where, you know, you, you are abused. I mean, you know, you were saying, like, as a child you, you or, or as, a, as a young teenager, you visualised your childhood and you visualised when you were in that dark room. I mean, without upsetting you much more, you know, but can you describe what that was like? You don't know when these people are coming back. And they've walked away out the room and they've left you. How does that feel? Uh, the the guys during my kidnap? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, that's much later because... Oh, okay. Yeah, so, I mean, just, just very quickly, and I'll get to that. So when I crossed the borders to go to Kosovo, I, I got taken firstly by the human trafficking, for well, sex trafficking and organ harvesting, and uh, because... Um, Initially, I got given shelter by, and it's very important I mention this because I dedicated this book and I have it inside of the book. It states dedicated to the two American police officers, Peter and Brian, just right at the front. And uh, they gave me shelter. I mean, they became the most, you know, sort of like the lion and, and the prey becoming, I'm not saying it in that sense, but they, I didn't know them. It's a different religion, different background. And... I was running from uniform and then ending up into a uniform kind of two guys that gave me shelter, which I'm very grateful. But then I got taken from their apartment just outside. I got taken by human trafficking. And these guys sold me to the highest bidder for, if I may say in here, for sex exploitation. And because uh, I was a virgin girl, young. And so for them, it was a huge cargo as they stated uh, and I stated in the book as well that the, the way they quote uh, referred to me as and um, that sort of began to really change me because I realized that this world was not innocent world that I knew it was really quite evil and when I escaped them and again it wasn't like just happened overnight or anything I mean they grew me and it was a long process with them and it was a lot of psychological game going on uh, between me and them because I just wanted to to survive and my only thing that I wanted to do to survive is so I can tell my parents what's happening rather than survive for myself there was always this will to make it through because of my parents and because uh, I wasn't really scared of not existing I was scared of them not knowing what had happened to me and um I gave an interview, I, I escaped them, I gave an interview at the police station because I got uh, rescued by this um, Italian police officer, UN police officer, peacekeeper. Got an interview and they said, you have to appear in, in court and Hague. And I was like, I don't think, I mean, I'm 17, God, I just need to run away. 
go back home and and so I did you know I said goodbye to my police officers because they they thought I just vanished uh in that period from being un- giving me shelter under their roof to literally gone just in a split second they didn't know what had happened to me and they were protecting me the reason they never took me to the red cross was that they said because I've spoken to them since I said why didn't you never give me you know to the red cross like I wanted to they said because the Red Cross is a great uh, organization, but in, in Kosovo at that time, it wasn't the right people. You've crossed borders. You came from Serbia into Kosovo. For us to send you there, it was like sending you to the wharf. The same thing would have happened. You know, they, they preyed on the youngsters. And obviously, inside, they had people that were looking for precious cargo, and it's nothing to do with the Red Cross. It had to do with corruption of the the amount of people involved in this, including, you know, perhaps people in the government and stuff. So anyway, I said my goodbyes, made it back to my parents. And when I came back to my parents, again, it was all illegally close, crossing the borders. My parents had gone into hiding underground in the basement because it was bombing and shooting and And I came into a town which seemed like ghost-like, you know, it just was quiet. You could see smoke from the bombing, but it was nobody about. It was really scary, quite like a haunted place. Managed to get to my parents and then I didn't really have much time to to describe to my parents what had happened in Kosovo. I got taken by the it's quite a complex story. During the war in Serbia, we had the usual army and then we had the army that was recruits from prisons to make the numbers. And the recruits from prisons wore trainers and normal army wore boots. And same as normal army revealed their faces, the, the, the recruits were wearing like covered faces, like a balaclava. And like, not balaclava, but you, I, I don't know what it's called, but you could just yeah. see the eyes. And it was those ones that came and collected me from my mom's, uh, mom and dad's garden. They literally dragged me in and I was like, mom and dad, don't worry, I'm going to just explain to them what had happened in Kosovo. And then, uh, you know, they're going to free me because I thought, you know, it's it's an army, you know, they're going to understand I'm, I'm part of Serbian kind of, I lived there all my life. <laughs> But I didn't, what I didn't realize is, um, so going back to that, when I woke up in, in that room, it was... Before that, I got interrogated quite badly. Uh, they were asking me, what was I doing in Kosovo? And am I a spy for the Kosovans? And I said, I'm not a spy. I mean, I'm just trying to escape you guys because you were about to massacre us. And I went into Kosovo and then I'm coming back because I got kidnapped over there. So I was telling them the story and they didn't believe me to the point where they, from beating me up, I, I had lost a couple of teeth at the back from being punched. They dislocated my jaw, which had to be fixed in the UK, uh, broke my nose. Uh, really looks a bit wonky, but it has been reconstructed. Ripped my ear. I've got a really dodgy ear here. It's been all like stitched up. It doesn't have much movement because it, it had to be, it was infected. And so dislocated my lower back I mean I've got bull, like a slip disc almost like non-existence they don't even exist anymore so I have really bad back pain and I got uh, branded on my carb so the last thing I remember on the interrogation is that heat that went on my carb and I, I just passed out and then I woke up in that room and I realized gosh where where am I it was like a grave I couldn't see anything it was just across the door you could see the light but there was no window I was almost like underground but I wasn't and a smelly place and just a blanket that I was lying on really quite confusing quite um panicking to to be in yeah and uh that's when I I I I realized that okay I thought "Mm, this is not looking good and initially I didn't really think long term. I thought I would just be like a couple of days and soon somebody will come and pick me up and they will see sense. But uh, none of that happened. It turned into six months of waiting and not waiting in a way. I I gave in, I gave up. Um, I went into 
starvation mode. I wanted to just give up forever because I I thought it was very inhumane kind of conditions. But it's funny that sometimes you know it's a saying that we use and it's 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 really used as a quote and I think it couldn't be more right when you feel like you are really buried in the dark and meaning not literally like I was but you feel like you are in a dark place maybe your work is not going right your relationship is not going right maybe something has triggered you just bear with it and and stick and persist because it's you are literally bury to blossom you know you you are you are being conditioned you are being shaped at that point it's not going to last forever and for me I think that really um I got buried so I could blossom and I'm really grateful that I had the strength and I created the resilience in me mentally and physically to 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 make it through because come on I'm nothing special if some if I could go through that and make it I'm sure everyone that has that big power in them like and we all possess that that we can make it through anything if you just have that you know what I can make it through you'll find a way to make it through it's really quite uh, fascinating the power of our mind and how we think what we think I asked this question yesterday at an event conference I said if you spoke to yourself I said the way uh, um, if you spoke to your friends the way you speak uh, to yourself sometimes by putting yourself down and judging yourself and you're not good enough or you too fat or too slim or too this and too that and you are not wanted and you are not you know just different things because I know this internal dialogue if you said that to a friend they wouldn't want to be your friend so why should you think you should speak like that to yourself so the power of the mind is very very important it's very strong so it's important how you speak to yourself regardless of what you are facing and if you're listening to this and you are going through a tough time read the book if you can uh, it will support a small amount of the donation will go to charity i'm starting to support a charity called uh, stop human trafficking and so if you really think if you really want to know the steps that I took, I'm always happy to answer people, any answers they have, any questions they have, so they can reach out. But the answer always lies within us. It's just a matter of recognizing the pain as a lesson rather than as, oh my God, it's just, it's always happening to me. Well, things are always happening to people. It's just a matter of life, you know, so it is what it is. Learn from it, grow from it, rise above it and and uh, it sounds hard you know it sounds like easy to say but I have I have to put it into practice every day it's just you know just you got to you you got to not let the world get to you because and other people's opinion doesn't define you you know your opinion of others doesn't define them so just be happy be grateful I think I'd say from my experience <laughs> Yeah, I mean, what a remarkable, if not disturbing story. And by the way, I will be reading your book. I deliberately didn't read it before we chatted because I wanted to hear all this fresh and new. So I, I didn't have any sort of preconceptions of, of what we would discuss. But I have to say it's such a powerful narrative. And I think I would encourage everyone tuning in to definitely buy the book. Um, And, you know, I have to ask, so, so obviously, thank you so much for sharing that. I know, I know it's tough. Um, and we don't want to give too much away because people should be reading the book. But the other thing is, I would just love to sort of, you know, as we sort of come to the end of this is, you know, once you know you were through that moment, you felt buried, but you were buried to blossom, which is really lovely. And I'm going to remember that and I'm going to start being nicer to myself. <laughs> How did you then, you know, look where you are now. So look where you were then. Yeah. And look where you are now. Can you just talk me through even briefly just the steps that you took to be where you are now so I guess you've obviously left the country by this point yeah I got rescued and uh, sent to the UK illegal as an illegal immigrant but I was a political child asylum seeker so I'm really grateful to the British governments that have given me the right to remain in this country pretty much immediately without any questions they knew with all the facts and figures and stuff they knew exactly they they did their di di diligence and they they understood the danger that I was in, and uh, also I would before I even get to how I went through I it, it links to the fact that 
I am grateful. And if you ever wonder as a listener what happens to the taxes, and I'm sure we all wonder sometimes uh, with the taxes that we pay, if you could just think that the small amount of it perhaps could go to someone like me that has no choice but to leave their home because nobody wants to leave home. If you leave because you want to travel, it's a very different feeling as opposed to leaving because you want to seek a better life or leaving because your life is in danger. So if you're wondering what happens to the refugees, perhaps, you know, they become like me. And so just uh, that small percentage that you give, just remember that you are doing a great, great deal out there that you're helping people. So that's your charity in itself. And how I managed to get to where I am is because of the taxes that are paid, the government managed to, obviously, with your help, the audience help here, uh, they managed to get me uh, housing initially and give me uh, the right care, uh, meaning uh, NHS, uh, different doctors, psychiatrists, because I was... uh, really really in bad shape and obviously reconstruct me although you know I they I've never really mentioned it so much because I I was so embarrassed I was so deformed but um, I realized that every scar that I have it's it's um, just a a sign of how strong I am so I embrace now all my you know flaws (laughs) and how did I get to this is when I decided that I I was enough to be able to work and I went to the government and I said I no longer need a housing benefit I don't want any uh, income support and I remember they sat me down they're like are you sure you're not having you know because they thought I'm going to go kill myself or something you know literally you know commit a suicide and I was in a bad way I said no no I've been studying and I want to work. And they're like, but you can still keep everything. I'm like, no, I found a man and I'm moving in with him. And still they didn't believe me. They're like, you really can't do this. I'm like, yeah, I actually can. I am going to. So finding that job, uh, doing something, helping people in in coaching industry. Sorry, guys, my nose is running from crying. <laughs> no. And uh I think it started being able to help other people because being in the fitness industry, what I noticed is by going to the gym or going for a walk, it started changing my mood. So it started changing how I thought and how I thought about just, you know, it was releasing a release of endorphins, which I didn't know at that point. But then I started studying it and I thought, oh, my God, this is great for me. So I want to be able to help people. But why did I want to help people? There was loads of personal trainers there. What I wanted to do is do something different, which when I was in the gym initially, I had trainers approach me and say, oh, do you want to lose weight? Do you want to build muscle? And I couldn't really speak much English anyway. I just said, no, I'm here because I feel good. And I remember this instant reaction. I'm here because I feel good. And I thought, do you know what? I want to be a trainer because I want to make people feel good rather than make them feel like they're fat or they need more muscle or anything like that. And so when I became a personal trainer, eventually people just loved being my clients because they got the results they wanted, but without the pressure of me measuring them all the time, me putting them on the scale, me asking them, oh, we need to lose more. It just happened gradually, whatever they wanted to achieve, because they felt good. They didn't know my story, but they could relate to me. They were the ones that would open up with their stories. And the more people taught me about their stories, the more I realized in 10 years in fitness and well-being, I thought, hang on a minute. These people come from such wealthy backgrounds. All these kids that I'm training, their kids, their mom and dads, their grandparents, very wealthy. I'm traveling with them, you know, as much as I can across the world. Yet they are coming to me telling me they've got these obstacles and stuff. So clearly... In life, money doesn't get rid of the obstacles. Anyone could, you know, everybody has pain. And that conditioned me to understand that I wasn't alone in this pain. I didn't, they didn't have to go through war to have the similar amount of pain or struggles. And I started really gelling and sort of understanding people better. And then eventually 
I um, obviously in that time I took steps of forgiving myself. So uh, a client of mine that I used to train, Gilles, he is very heavily involved in uh, like a meditation kind of uh, way, which I I'm not going to just keep on dropping stuff, names and and so on, but it's it's like a divine light kind of meditation, and it's uh, Japanese. Um, the founder is from Japan. And he introduced me to it. He said, Loretta, could I just introduce you to this? Because I think you could benefit. And I said, yes, I didn't question him. He was my mentor. He was my 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 client in fitness industry. And he made me close my eyes and trust him in, in this meditation, which because I always needed to be in control. I never wanted to, to somebody to tell me, close your eyes and don't open them for 10 minutes. I thought, you don't tell me what to do because I was so fearful fearful of not being in control. But I trusted him and I closed my eyes for 10 minutes. And when I opened them and he took me through, he was guiding me through. Honestly, when I opened my eyes, he said, Loretta, it's amazing, isn't it? I said, And I started crying. I said, that was beautiful because I could trust him. And then we started practicing this divine light and it really healed me. I, I learned, I did a seminar with him and they taught me the art of forgiveness and that started with forgiving myself and then forgiving others and obviously I was making other changes like with fitness industry I was doing lots of walking and working with people getting their goals in track and I was understanding the food better that food is energy so what we eat really does affect how we think and internal organs so I started making better choices because I went from Coming to the UK, I came from being starved to literally slowly regaining my health in that sense. So, yeah, we looked at that. And I I am a strong believer that mindset is like creating a physical fitness. And once you do a step by step by just forgiving yourself, as I mentioned, learning to forgive others, seeking alternative ways like meditation or yoga whatever you might be or a climb or a hike or a run or a walk by the beach all this natural thing that nature has created giving it to us for free you will start that's why people say you know when I run or, or I go for long walks I clear my head it's actually that's what it does so you should continue to do it and then other things is what really healed me is speaking up. I started speaking up in Singapore about what had happened to me because I got involved with these uh, different com organizations that support women at war or women of abuse. And I wanted to raise funds for the companies and not just through me coaching on learning and development on public speaking and presentation skills. I wanted to do something more meaningful. So I wanted to share my story and, um, I shared my story also during the presentation skills because I then demonstrate the how do you story tell when you stood up and you're about to present your element, your content, but how do you link your life story? It doesn't have to be your personal story, just a life story about how did you come to be in the company and so on. But I would use my story because I wanted I wanted to get to people. I wanted to, in a nice way. I wanted to make sure people would open up in, in a classroom where we were doing the coaching and so a few of my clients uh, that were mds or vps they would attend my coaching sessions on presentation skills with their team sales team or creative teams and they heard the snips of the story and so they would come after and say loretta you don't have a book do you i'm like no i never thought of doing a book and they would be like well i want to hire you to do a speech because we have a conference coming on like for example wpp hired me twice I say hired me. They didn't really hire me. They booked me in and obviously it was all inclusive uh, to stay at this place in Thailand. They had conference, non-conference kind of for three days in, in Phuket. And I was there three times uh, talking and dealing with different delegates that would create roundtables to discuss different topics and my job was to give some tips of how to lead and just some presentation skills tips. But then I also got asked to get on stage and present 
to the whole audience my story as a motivational speech this was wow uh, you know WPP really was very supportive of that Sir Martin Sorrell at that time because he he was under the he was the owner of the company still he was really blown away and he was really quite um, emotional because he said his parents were also immigrants and refugees because they were uh, Jewish and during the war at that time so he got really tearful which I thought you know what if I could get to people like that and clearly the story is get, is reaching everyone with great success and I continued to speak quite a lot with different the banks the financial industries and whoever I work with uh, being in media banking or even oil and gas or energy or even embassies I ended up also doing the speeches, which immediately the funds for hiring me as a speaker, I would just donate it to the charities. I worked with UN Women Singapore. I worked with AWARE, Women on Emission. So it was three different com- uh, organizations, nonprofit that I I loved being part of in, in different sort of different uh, kind of topics that they did. And that's why I thought, you know what, um, the more I spoke, the more I healed. And if I, I was encouraging the audience to speak up as well. So if something that was bothering them or they were being molested in a family, they got the courage. I, I almost created this awareness. In Singapore, it was taboo. You didn't speak about it. And people just kept it to themselves. They were ashamed. And then slowly, slowly, they really started saying no. So women... The more I spoke, the more women came forward to yeah. say no to that. And I, it's almost like, I don't want to say it to that extent, but it's almost like I created that, uh, oh, what's the word for it? I created that movement that women can say no to stuff. And then the, the Indian community, they were so with it. They were like, we stand by you. And they were literally inviting me to all of their events and wanting me to speak to the point where, I even spoke on behalf of this um, Indian girl that was badly abused and got sent to Singapore from India for medical attention, and she died in Singapore. When they did her documentary, I mean, I felt really honored to be able to speak on her behalf, but I also felt so unfair that she didn't make it. And her mom says, um, my daughter, before she died in Singapore, because she was being medic- in, under medical intensive care in Singapore because she was so badly damaged, she said to her mom, Mom, I'm so sorry, what happened? It's all my fault. And it wasn't her fault. And so I thought, you know what, the more I, I'm going to continue to speak about this, the more people are going to feel comfortable talking about it and uh, being aware that mental health is very important to be taken yeah. care of and for us to be okay to talk about mental health it's not all about talking oh yeah it's all well and good I struggle yeah. with mental health and I stand by it I think when someone says I'm struggling with mental health take it seriously and try and help them if you can't help them hear them out or, or try to 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 be there just just as someone that they can trust it's so yeah. important so yeah wow well do you know what I mean I think you're not you're like super woman you know and your superpower is obviously I think what I've got from this is to speak up tell the tales of things that happened to you and learn to forgive and do you know what I, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart because I know that this is a really sensitive emotive subject for you um, and I hope that so many people go out and read your book now so thank you thank you so much it is my pleasure. Thank you so much for choosing me to inspire your audience. And I hope they are inspired. And if 100%. they read the book, they should remember I'm alive. <laughs> you are alive and you have proven the tale that, you know what, you can do anything that you want to do. Um, and you are a survivor. So thank you so much. It is my absolute pleasure, Lynn. And if anyone is wondering where to get the book, sorry, I'm not doing a sales pitch, but it will Go have for it. It is available on Amazon because I keep forgetting to mention it. And I self-published on purpose uh, because I wanted people to have access quickly and easy. Yeah. And with Amazon, is in, in every market, is affordable, and it's it's next day kind of almost delivery, which is really good. It's what I wanted. 
I didn't want this to sit there forever for next year to be published. I just couldn't anymore. I had to do it. And it was such a relief. You know, it was a cathartic thing to do. So, yeah, I'd love to hear if anybody uh, reads the book and they want to give me some feedback or have questions. Uh, That's what's making me uh, thrive. So please do get in touch with me. I will. I promise I always respond. So I'd love to hear the feedback and, you know, the reviews, of course, is going to help the book. So I'm really excited to see what they have to say. (laughs) I'm going out to buy mine now. So you'll get another sale today. (laughs) Thank you very much, Lynn. Thank Thank you. you.